Our meeting for the afternoon of November 2nd, 2021. We'll begin with a Pledge of, the, of Allegiance. If you're able to stand, please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, today's invocation will be provided by Father Jerry Wade, the Chancellor of Belmont College Prep, Councilmember Mayhan will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to introduce Father Jerry Wade, who will give today's invocation. Father Wade has been a part of Bellarmine College Prep, which is the oldest high school in the state of California, along with Notre Dame High School, right here in San Jose, ever since he graduated from the school in 1955. He is currently Bellarmine's chancellor and works for the advancement of the school, as well as doing ministry for Bellarmine alumni and their families, including funerals, memorials, weddings, baptisms, hospital visits, and much more. Through joy and grief, generations of alumni have reached out and continue to reach out to Father Wade for spiritual guidance and his personal blessing. In fact, I know of at least one alumnus who traveled all the way from another state to have his child baptized here in San Jose by Father Wade. Apparently there aren't any Catholic churches in Arizona. <laughs> Father Wade is famous for his unparalleled memory, especially for faces, names, graduation years, family histories, and personal anecdotes. I will never forget how on my first day on campus, arriving as a work-study student all the way from Watsonville, who knew no one at the school, or so I thought, Father Wade came across campus to find me, check in, and personally welcome me to the school. He even regaled me with a few funny stories about my wild uncles and a cousin who had attended the school many years before. Turns out only one of them left with a diploma, just to <laughs> give you a sense of the caliber of the stories. <laughs> Father Wade has an incredible gift for seeing beauty in all people, celebrating their moments of joy, and providing comfort in difficult times. In Father Wade, I certainly see the living embodiment of the Ignatian value of finding God in all things, which is why it is such an honor to invite him today to provide our invocation. With that, Father Wade, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt, and I assure you all that Matt does have a diploma from Bellamin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. <clears throat> Yesterday, as I reflected on the particular scripture readings used at our Sunday liturgy, I thought the words of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy of the Hebrew Scriptures and the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark were quite appropriate as we pause in prayer to begin the council meeting. Moses speaks with his people this great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then Jesus first repeats these words of uh, Moses in the Gospel of Mark, but he adds a second great commandment, and you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so let us take a moment with ongoing gratitude, first of all, for our families, our colleagues, uh, those with whom we happen to be in our everyday life in our city of San Jose. And may we be people of hope, and help others to be hope-filled with an appreciation of themselves, including those in need. And when we talk and discuss with one another, may we always listen with appropriate and meaningful empathy and truly be able to hear what is in their hearts. And Lord God, continue to give us patience with others and also patience with ourselves. Help us to be channels of your justice and a means by which others may feel good about themselves. We ask your blessings on our civic leaders and in particular, the women and men of the city, of Cons city council of San Jose, our mayor and those who serve us by sharing their time, their energy, their resources, and at times their sense of humor. And as we begin this month of November, we pray in thanksgiving for those who have gone before us, family members and all who have these many years stepped forward to make a difference for the good 
in the lives of the people of San Jose, those who are young and those who are much older. And we ask you this as we say amen. And thank you. Thank you, Father. It's always great to have you back here at City Hall. Uh, all right, we are on to our ceremonial items. And I wanted to first invite Councilmember Davis to join me at the podium. We'll recognize and proclaim National Adoption Month. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to once again proclaim November as National Adoption Month in San Jose. National Adoption Month is a time to bring attention to the thousands of children and youth within foster care who would love a permanent home. With over 120,000 children awaiting adoption from foster homes throughout the nation, San Jose believes every child should have a forever family. I like to say that adoption runs in my family because multiple people joined our family through adoption, including my sister and my own two children. And I'm sure my colleagues are sick of me saying that after four or five years of doing National Adoption Month. Before we adopted, my husband and I were foster parents and we are forever grateful to the support we received along the way and continue to receive today from parents who have similar stories to ours. The Kinship Adoptive and Foster Parent Association provided that support. They're an advocacy and nonprofit that provides resources, specialized mentoring, and advocates for the needs of families in Santa Clara County. Denise Marshu has been the executive director for the Kinship Adoptive and Foster Parent Association for the past 11 years. In addition to that, she has fostered over 120 children and adopted five of her 10 children. I invite Denise to accept the proclamation and say a few words. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank the council here for acknowledging adoptive families this month. It's so important for us to remember that they're out there and they're raising our future generation. And today, I just want to take two minutes to talk about some of the children that come into care. First, we have Adam. Adam was born addicted to heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, and methadone. He suffers with fetal alcohol syndrome. He's a young adult now, but because of his adoptive family, was able to grow up and become a productive adult in our community. Aaron was a little boy who had three quarters of a heart. And although he struggled at birth and struggled his first year, he found a forever home that stayed with him and took care of him until he passed away just before he was two years old. And then there's Jesse. And Jesse, we were told, was unadoptable. Nobody was gonna take this little Down syndrome child that had all these problems. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesse is a 10-year-old who talks from the moment he wakes up in the morning until the moment he goes to bed at night. He is thriving, he plays ball, he loves hockey, he loves annoying us, and we adopted him and he is mine. <laughs> so he is adoptable. There is no child out there that is unadoptable. And I wanna thank all the families that open their homes and their hearts and take our future generation in and love them just like they're their own. When I see my 10 children, I don't see a difference. I love them all. I'm committed to them forever and ever and they are mine. So thank you again for acknowledging our adoptive families. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you, Councilmember Davis, not just for talking the talk, but walking the walk, and how you support adoption in our community. Um, Councilmember Reynes, I know, will be joining us. 
as we honor members of our Sikh American community and Sikh American uh, Appreci Appreciation Month and Awareness Month. Mayor, I think it's safe to say it's appreciation and awareness. Um, one goes with the other. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Sukhdev and his daughter, Harkira, um, and I believe Sarjeet uh, Baines is here as well. Um, I learned this from our, our Sikh, uh, Sikh communi community, which is Wadharakji Kalkalsa, Wadharakji Kifate, and it means victory to God, God's pure one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've learned a, a thing or two in the years that I have been visiting the Gurdwara. Um, November is Sikh Amer American Awareness and Appreciation Month, and I'm thrilled for this opportunity to have Sukhdev Sergeet and his daughter Harkira, one of um, our leading Gurdwara board members, here with us. And it's a joy to be able to recognize and appreciate such an important part of our community here in the council chambers Again, it is um, so heartwarming to see people in person um, and, uh, and to reconnect once again. And uh, Sikh Americans, if, uh, for those of you who may not know, have been part of our community since the late 1800s. And we are set and have been central to our history and present community, doing everything from building railroads, serving in the US Army, leading our nation, and serving in the U.S. Army since World War I, and leading our nation and our region in fields of technology, health, science, agriculture, the arts, and public service. The largest Sikh Gurdwara outside of India is right here in the foothills of District 8. If you haven't had the opportunity, I would encourage you to do so. Um, it is a beautiful setting in the East Foothills, like I said, and um, every day, our Gurwada uh, Sahib, they have an open door policy and they offer longer meal. Um, and it is absolutely yummy. Um, one of the reasons why I, I identify with, with the Sikh uh, Americans is their ability to serve our community. Before the pandemic, through the pandemic, um, they find ways to provide service and honor their culture and the value of service. And this is something that linked me and, identi and identified with this community because it reminded me of my own family. My family really prioritized serving and, um, and I think it's one of the reasons why I'm in public service. And if I had to say anything about our Sikh Americans is, is their ability to serve others is, has really no end and no bounds and so it is an honor to present this proclamation to the San Jose Gurdwara in recognition of Sikh American Awareness and Appreciation Month, and I'm grateful for their contributions to the city of San Jose. I'd like to introduce Sikh Dev, and I'm not sure if uh, Sujit will be speaking, but I think you'll learn more from them as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, members of the city council, mayor, and all those attending this meeting here. Uh, I would like to appreciate and thank the uh, council and the mayor for having this uh, proclamation in recognizing November as Sikh Awareness and Appreciation Month. Uh, the Sikh community has done, as uh, Sylvia said, uh, uh, through the pandemic, before the pandemic, and any time there is a, na a national disaster of any type, uh, we're, we're there to help in any way we can. Uh, through the pandemic, we did reach out to the city to see how we could help. And uh, we were able to help by providing meals, uh, you know, through different drives that we had at the Gurdwara and at uh, high schools. So uh, one thing uh, this, uh, Appreciation Month and Awareness Month that's going to bring is the identity of the Sikhs. As you all can see, I'm wearing a turban. We do look different uh, than, and that does bring some challenges to the community and to the city also. So some of the challenges that we run into is hate crimes, you know, uh, I myself went through schooling here. Uh, 
you know, uh, through the 90s and then through college and all that, uh, you know, at that time, I was uh, told I'm Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, and then 911 uh, happened, and then I was told that I'm bin Laden. Uh, and now, just recently, um, not me, but uh, somebody else, because of what's happened in Afghanistan, uh, they were saying, okay, hey, Taliban, go back. So uh, those challenges, although we think uh, the Sikh community, you know, resides in big numbers in San Jose, those challenges are still there. And, uh, and then uh, recently there is a bullying that happened in one of the uh, schools also. And in all those instances, we have brought it up to the uh, elected officials and I appreciate them taking, uh, you know, immediate, uh, you know, providing immediate attention to it and taking action. So, I'd like to really appreciate that uh, to our uh, our city officials for taking action on any of those incidents that happen. But I personally think uh, there's more that can be done, and this is one event uh, that city. Uh, I would actually not only have the proclamation, but if there's any other avenues to get the the Sikh image out there to all the uh, all the uh, communities, I would appreciate that. Uh, we uh, we're doing our part, uh, you know, trying to be part of the community by having Sikh heritage nights at SAP. Um, or having other types of events supporting uh, all the uh, city uh, events and all that. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, maybe city could do a little bit more. Uh, that's what I would ask uh, uh, on today at this uh, event, uh, you know, somehow highlight who the Sikhs are. So we feel more as a community in Silicon Valley than always being uh, you know, somehow not feeling safe here. Uh, I don't feel unsafe, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, maybe I had some thoughts, but I, I don't want my kids or other kids to have that, so I uh, would appreciate uh, the city, uh, uh, first of all, thank the city for doing what they're doing today, and then having more events. And one other thing could be, you know, more seeks on uh, the staff, uh, city staff, or maybe uh, commissions and all that. Uh, thank you again, uh, the whole city council, the mayor, for having this event today and recognizing November as a Sikh uh, Awareness and Appreciation Month. Thank you. Bye. All right, now I'd like to ask Salvador Bustamante, also known as Chava, to please join us. Councilmember Carrasco, I believe, will be leading us and commending Mr. Bustamante for all of his contributions to the community for many years. I know, I'm asking uh, Council Member Esparza also to join us. Uh, it's a very special moment. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Magdalena Carrasco, and I represent our beautiful, part of our beautiful Eastside San Jose District 5. Uh, and I'm here with Council Member Esparza on a very special uh, occasion to honor our great friend, Salvador Bustamante Meni know him as Chava. For over 40 years, Chava has worked to promote labor rights, human rights, civil rights, immigration rights uh, all over our region and actually throughout the state of California. You'd be hard pressed to find someone in our great city that hasn't been graced by the impact of Chava. My first experience with Chava was during my second run for city council my second run. I didn't win the first time. And I was told that if I wanted to win, 
If I stood a chance of winning, I needed to be blessed by Chava Bustamante. So when I interviewed with Chava, I found that actually Chava and I had already been connected several times over by other individuals who were very significant in my life. At that time, uh, he had worked with now council member Kevin De Leon. At that time, he was a civic leader in the Los Angeles area. And my cousin, labor leader Cindy Avitia, who just a year before I interviewed with Chava had lost her life tragically in a car accident in Mexico. At that point, Chava se clavó en mi corazón. Our bond when it was inexplicably formed. We worked on many issues and shared values. But to know Chava is to love Chava. Chava's journey to the U.S. is not unique to Chava. When I think of him, I see my cousins, I see my tios, I see my father. That's one of the reasons why so many of us connect to Chava. And I imagine that that's also one of the reasons why he's so empathetic to the struggles of others. In 1968, he came to the United States from Mexico looking for opportunity and worked the fields for 12 years where he connected with the United Farm Workers Union in Salinas and participated in his first ever strike that year. He formally joined the union in 75 where he recognized the incredible reach and potential of the unions. After his time with SEIU, where he served for 19 years, Chava went on to help establish and work as a full-time volunteer executive director for Latino United for a New America, or LUNA as we know it. While working for LUNA, Chava has helped to empower our Latino community in the east side of San Jose, but I would say citywide, countywide, regionwide. Since Chava's tenure, the program has grown exponentially. The legacy that Chava leaves behind has been one of hope, a desire to raise up our community. And through his, his dedication and hard work, Chava has helped many of our community members prosper by taking them under his wing and inculcating in them strong values. Chava leaves a legacy of leadership and mentorship that has helped pave the way for the next generation of community leaders and give a voice to those of us who historically have been without a voice. Chava has served in almost every capacity, being a fellow with the American Leadership Forum and serving on the board of several nonprofit organizations like Working Partnerships USA, Silicon Valley Rising, and Sacred Heart Community Service. Chava also lent his voice to our various of flea market vendors advocating for a fair outcome ensuring that they were prepared with the tools for success. Personally, as the daughter of Teamsters who worked at the Del Monte Cannery plant number three, I quickly learned to walk the picket line alongside them. And although I didn't understand all the issues at the time, I clearly recognized that there was strength and unity. And I really understood that you never cross a picket line. Chava and his work is embedded in that legacy of hardworking men and women that strive to improve the working conditions of not only union members, but everybody in our community. It's with great honor that I, along with my colleague, Maya Sparza, and with the mayor, Sam Licardo, and my council colleagues, present this commendation to you, Chava. Thank you for all of your work and your dedication, a lifetime of commitment to our community. Uh, I know that Council Member Sparza has a few things to say, so I'm going to give the mic before I give it to you. <laughs> Thank you to Council Member Carrasco for her leadership in, um, in doing this important honor. Um, I just wanna highlight some of the incredible work that Chava and Luna have done during COVID, this unprecedented crisis. Councilmember Carrasco um, talked about what Chava has done throughout his whole life, really, to lift people up and provide opportunity for so many people. But we've, we've been in a once in a lifetime pandemic um, and seen some of the greatest challenges that our Latino community has ever faced. 
And in a time when our Latino communities have been hit with the worst impacts of this pandemic, Chava and Luna stepped up to keep our residents housed, counted, fed. These are the same residents who served as our essential workers, putting their bodies and health on the line to support their families and support all of us. Under Chava's leadership, Luna was also an absolutely crucial partner in our efforts to ensure that our Latino residents and the East Side were counted in the 2020 census amid the challenges of the pandemic and the attempts of the Trump administration to cut the census short. And so Chava and Luna stepped up so that our neighborhoods wouldn't be erased in the East Side. And that's another legacy that he leaves for our communities. So I, again, I just wanted to recognize Chava for his leadership, for his efforts um, throughout, that he's given us throughout his whole life, but also just remind folks that he and Luna have been out there in these unprecedented times. They've essentially helped save lives. Thank you, Chava. But would it, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Council Member Carrasco and Council Member Sparza, members of the Council, Mayor Ricardo. Um, I have a few comments, but uh, you know, since I'm about to be 70, I put them in writing. I don't want to forget. And um, I personally believe that uh, no one should uh, be recognized for fulfilling their duty. However, I accept this commendation with humility because it allows me to continue to speak about the issues and needs that affect the quality of life of thousands of residents in our beautiful city, particularly those who live in the east side of San Jose. San Jose is a great city uh, to live in. However, the gap between rich and poor has become wider than ever. The COVID-19 pandemic came to highlight the lack of equity that prevails in our city. A couple of Sundays ago, I uh, was sent into retirement at an event from uh, Latinos United for, uh, for New America. Um, and, uh, you know, I retired from my professional responsibilities as executive director of the organization. But that doesn't mean that I have withdrawn from my activism. I will remain present and active because many of the needs of our people still, are still unresolved. So I thank you again and uh, be assured that uh, you probably have not heard, uh, seen the last of me. <laughs> and uh, before you know, um, I uh, stop talking, I want to recognize Roberto Gonzalez and. Alfonso Mendes, um, because it was thanks like, you know, to people like them that I've been able to, um, uh, to do the things I've done. So thank you, Alfonso. Thank you, Roberto. Right, on the orders of the day, um, and they ask if my colleagues have any changes to the printed agenda. I know there's a new item, which is 2.16 redistricting commission appointment, which will be added under orders of the, uh, if it is going to be added, it requires a two thirds vote. I've also submitted a memorandum on item 3.3, which is 
the pandemic response and community and economic recovery budget adjustments. Uh, the memo uh, seeks a deferral, and I'll just read it since I know this came out very belatedly. I want to make sure uh, uh, when understands the, the, the reason here. In light of recent uncertainty in the state's treatment of tax revenues, uh, I seek to defer council consideration of any allocation of American uh, Rescue Act spending until the resolution of those and related fiscal issues. The city manager is directed to return to council with recommendations for essential expenditures required for critical programs and services in the meantime. So I believe that would also require two thirds vote. Is that right, Nora? Yes, Mayor. Okay. So we'll entertain motions or any additions. Move approval, second. Okay, and that includes both 216 and 3.3, .3, is that right? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Foley. And second, I believe is Councilmember Sparza. Okay, uh, let's vote on orders of the day. That's unanimous. I think Councilmember Reynes' device is not working. Yeah, she's pointing. Okay, thank you. On to the closed session report, Norm. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. All right, on the consent calendar, um, I believe Councilmember Spars would like to pull item 2.9, which is a grant application for the California Department of Parks and Rec Prop 68 uh, relating to park development at Midfield and Havana. Uh, I believe there are also public comments, is that right? Tony? Okay. Specific item for, or for all of consent. Okay. Are there any other items other than 2.7 and 2.9 to pull? All right, why don't we go first to 2.7. Uh, and for folks at home, that is the item uh, the conditional summary vacation declaration of surplus and sale of a portion of North Almaden Boulevard. And Tony will take our speakers who are present and then we'll go to the public. I have Olga and Ruben, please come down. Um, whoever's first, come straight to the microphone. So again, that's Olga and Ruben. My name is Ruben Nuno, and I work at the Fireman San Jose, and I have to return when, it's, when it reopens. I live in South San Jose neighborhood. I've been a member of the United Health Local 19 for 22 years. And we have all my fellow members, and I ask you to vote no on item 2.7. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olga Arrieta, and I work at the San Jose Convention Center. I live in East Hyde uh, neighborhood, and I have been member for Local 19 for 22 years. And we are here and asking you to vote no on Arun 2.7, the land sale to Almaden Corner. Don't approve this deal without getting more for the community. We have called, emailed, and held action about this because we believe hospitality workers and to greater community deserve a voice in public land sales. We think you should not sell this land we are waiting more information benefits. Don't sell the San Jose Shore. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, are there other, any other speakers present? Yes, I have four hands up. Tessa Woodmancy. And I just ask, I see there are many other people who are present here. We signed 
I just encourage you, if you'd like to speak, please submit a card and we'll be happy to hear from you. Oh, yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Tessa Woodman C. I just wanted to um, read something about the consent calendar. It says if a member of the city council staff or public requests discussion on a particular item, that item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. So I wanted to take out that item in regards to the Winchester proper, what is it, the, um, well, the Almaden, it's Almaden and Santa Clara, I guess that's, maybe that's what we're talking about right now, 2.7, is that property that is, um, you know, next to that hotel and, oh, in the corner of Santa Clara and, and Almaden, I guess that is it, so maybe we're talking about it right now, and, yes, are, um, okay, good, so then that, that's good, and that is public land that I was all, but I think it's just important for us to make comments to you, Mayor Licardo, that the public can pull and to ask us what items we want to pull as well. That was the point. And so, um, you know, I was thinking about this item on Almaden that's, I guess, next to that hotel or that, you know, it's a big um, housing complex, a tall building. And um, so, yeah, it is public land. And I know they want it for, some, you know, it's not a big piece, but what in terms of our climate crisis and resiliency, any open lands should be created for growing food. And that, you know, it's easy to take open lands because it's undeveloped. And we have to really start making these transformational changes about how we're going forward. And we need to degrow. That needs to be our emphasis is degrowth because growth is fossil fuel use. And so we have to start, you know, we have to bring that down eight years to go to zero. That's very quick. That's what the science says, 2030. That's eight years practically now. And so this is where to create that sustainability because those 18 wheelers aren't going to be bringing our food in. We need to start taking open lands to grow food. Gregory Kepferl. Yes, hi, uh, this is Greg Kepferly, CEO of Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. And Mayor Licardo, thank you for uh, uh, deferring the uh, ARPA discussion. I realize there were a bunch of people ready to, to speak today, uh, including myself, but uh, making sure that uh, the community has time to weigh in on the priorities is also going to be important uh, in addition to whatever the state tax consequences you're looking at. Uh, the other issue is I think uh, the memos that uh, council members Arenas and Esparza uh, presented, um, I think deserve more consideration and looking at uh, how uh, investments in our children in terms of childcare uh, capacity building, as well as promotoras uh, within the, the safety net areas of the community. And then of course, all of the other recommendations in terms of the economic development that is uh, uh, centered in equity that uh, the other council members have have proposed. So I just want to say uh, thank you and uh, keep working. We'll keep providing input. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, it being uh, the beginning of November, uh, I guess I wanted to ask a few procedural questions about uh, how consent is run. First, a thank you to the previous two speakers uh, about this item today. Um, I really like the current mural that's in that area. So uh, thank you for the public comment. Um, I, uh, I'm a bit concerned that uh, uh, orders of the day, a closed session report and the city manager's report, it has an inconsistency about allowing public comment. And I will speak more at uh, open forum time to ask uh, how it can be a more consistent process. Um, I guess that's about all for now. Uh, will you be taking public comment uh, on the dropped item today? Uh, and that's another question to ask about consistency issues. Thanks for your time. And uh, hopefully you can allow time for uh, public comment on the remainder of consent items uh, after these two polled items. Thank you. Mr. Beekman, you haven't spoken on item 2.7. I'm taking your comment as comments on the entire consent calendar. Okay. Michelle Khalif. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Kalish and I am against uh, 2.7. I just wanted to add a public comment on that and that's all I have. Thank you. 
Louise Auerhahn. Uh, hello, Mayor Council Members. Louise Auerhahn from Working Partnerships. I was attempting to comment on the deferral under orders of the day uh, with item 3.3. We understand this item needs to be deferred, but we did have a large number of community members wanting to speak on it. So I hope that when it does come back, it'll be presented in a way and with enough time that the community is able to give input, uh, possibly consider having it at an evening session because it was difficult for people to schedule to come today and it, it will be more difficult the next time it comes around. Uh, so just wanted to ask you to give consideration. Uh, we also uh, strongly support the memo that was submitted by council members Esparza and Arenas with proposals for funding greater equity and support for working people with those funds and look forward to talking about that more fully when it comes back. Thank you. Gabriel. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, um, Gabriel Hernandez with the uh, Si Se Puede Collective. Um, I'm actually uh, speaking to item 3.3, I guess that has been deferred now. Um, and again, we would like you to consider, again, the memos um, moved by Arenas and Esparza. We think that um, our children need and deserve more. Uh, we would like you to consider, again, those memos in allocating the resources uh, to augment child and youth services. Um, they also should be used to expand after school programs, um, full scholarships, um, uh, child care services, um, you know, things where, again, especially in the neighborhoods that we organize in and work in um, and that were impacted very much so by the pandemic. And also, if you want to go down the, the route of um, the inequities that the neighborhoods have uh, suffered for decades, I think, again, using some of these funds um, to dedicate towards those types of programs. We also um, uh, believe that, you know, the models that we use around our training and the organizing of promotores and that model for community engagement has also helped um, engage community members in the process of participating in, in civic meetings like this. Um, and so we urge you all to, again, um, consider those memos of uh, Rarenas and um, uh, Esparza, uh, council members uh, at NSS Esparza, and uh, looking forward to that discussion when it comes up. Thank you. Before we go to the next speaker, I have several hands going up, and I suspect they may want to talk about item 3.3 .3 instead of 2.7. Yeah, let me just articulate. We're, we're taking public comment now on item 3.7, which relates, I'm sorry, excuse me, 2.7, thank you. Uh, which specifically relates to the sale of a portion of North Almaden Boulevard. That is the item for which we're accepting comment. There has already been voted on orders of the day deferral of item 3.3, which is the budget related item to the American uh, Recovery Plan uh, funding. And that will be taken up in a future council meeting. We'll hear public comment when we take that up on a future date. So right now we're just hearing public comment public comment on item 2.7. Okay, so several hands went down. I have one hand left up, Erica Valentine. Hi, thank you, City Council. This is Erica Valentine from UA Local 393. I'm just asking for you to consider a little bit more community engagement on this so that we can talk about local workforce standards as well as the implementations that it may have on climate change before we proceed with this. Thank you. Back to the mayor. Thank you. Okay, on um, item 2.7, uh, uh, we'll take a separate, do we wanna take it? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Prof, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I just wanna be able to provide, provide some context, context for, for my, my colleagues, colleagues uh, uh, in the public. public. So this item was on a consent agenda uh, about a month ago, and uh, it did have a pretty minimal community outreach, just the, the minimum requirement. And due to that, we heard some public comment from uh, both Unite Here members as we hear today, and then from the access residents that live uh, adjacent to this property uh, and actually share some of the, 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 if you look at the memo here, here's some of, of about half of the property that we're talking about being uh, taken over. Um, and so we actually did ask for it to be per deferred a couple of weeks. 
we actually went out, had some community meetings with the community on the project, and uh, we did ultimately learn that there was, and this actually was what, why it was deferred uh, last time, we learned that there was uh, an incorrect uh, reference of a grantee uh, for the access condominiums property. That's what this replacement memo that you'll see here uh, clarifies. The direction itself, though, um, is, is staying the same. It is a total of 1,381 square feet of uh, surplus property. It's a combination of driveway and sidewalk, uh, of which about half, 674 square feet, is going to be uh, going into the, the new Almaden Corner Hotel project that is, it's obviously not existing there yet. It's an approved project, um, and this will go, not the whole thing, about 529 square feet of it will go into that project. The rest of it will be, will be sidewalk. Uh, the other half, 707 square feet, is going to be sold over to the Access Condominium Building for a dollar. Uh, that property is, is still utilized today for ingress and egress of the condominium building, so that will, that will stay the same, but it's the, the title, obviously, and the, the ownership it will, will now change. Uh, we are going to be getting 213 $1,000, uh, I believe, for the property there, that uh, 218000 excuse me, um, that is fair market value of the sale of that, that property. Uh, ultimately, again, the 674 square feet. Um, and uh, this is something that, that I support. I understand the community has concerns on the outreach. I do feel that we went out and we did do adequate outreach after that, uh, that concern was brought to us. And uh, we'll make the motion to approve the item. Okay. Motion and second. So we'll vote separately on 2.7 first. Let's vote. All right. That vote is unanimous when the one absence. All right, item 2.9 is a grant application uh, for Prop 68 money for the park at Midfield and Havana. Councilmember Spartan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if we could pull up a photo um, for this item. Uh, that would be great. Um, in 2014, the Tropicana Lanai community came together with the idea of turning a small, unsightly piece of Caltrans property along a sound wall that was often a problem site in the neighborhood and turned it into a community gathering place, a place for kids to enjoy, a place to host the many holiday celebrations, and importantly, a place the community can be proud of. In 2015, Luna applied for and received a grant from the Open Space Authority, taking the community one step closer to this dream. And I believe the Open Space Authority is on the um, online, and we can pull that yeah. up after, because I'm hoping she'll, uh, Andrea can make some remarks. Yes. So unbeknownst to the community, this was the start to a six-year battle of working with three different government agencies and a nonprofit, along with bringing the community into every step of the decision-making process. Though many obstacles existed, the drive, passion, and persistence of the residents within this community kept this project alive and progressing through every devastating blow and through every small win. This is a community that was selling tamales to raise money for a park. So saying this pocket park is important to this community is a major understatement. Being designated as a community of concern, many members of this neighborhood live with overcrowding and a complete lack of publicly accessible open space needed for the many young families in the neighborhood. There is no park in this neighborhood. So the Havana Midfield Pocket Park project has grown from a simple pocket park along a sound wall to really an example of how a commitment from the community, a nonprofit organization like Luna, and several public agencies can make a project happen, even if it takes years of monthly meetings between all the stakeholders and countless hours by the community, Luna, city staff, and my staff to ensure that we are making progress no matter how small. So I, I pulled this item from the consent calendar because although it may be one of the smallest items we vote on in this meeting. Today's action, pending the award of the grants, we will be closing the funding gap for this pocket park, which would allow us to break ground next year. And you'll see in the photo, that's the mural that we did along the sound wall, and that patch of dirt is what the neighborhood, they pick up trash. Um, 
they do it regularly once a week, but if somebody, if they're, if you see litter, someone will come out and they'll pick it up so that it doesn't get dirty. So there are so many people that contributed to making this project happen. I'd like to thank Victoria Partida, president of the Tropicana Lanai Neighborhood Association, Andrea McKenzie, general manager of the Open Space Authority, who you will hear from in a minute, Chava Bustamante and Luna, David Johnson, Eve Zudi from PRNS, Jane Wu from Public Works, Thomas Harris and Kevin Ice from Real Estate Services, and I'm gonna give a shout out to Nick Kaspar on my staff. So I'd like to now have Andrea McKenzie, General Manager of the Open Space Authority, say a few words if she can. Thank you, Councilmember Sparza. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor McCullough, uh, Council Members. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I do want to just pick up on Councilmember Sparza's words that on November uh, 10th, 2016, the Open Space Authority Board of Directors awarded $250,000 to Latinos United for a New America, Luna, for their Nuestro Lugar project to transform this unused street right of way in the midfield neighborhood into a neighborhood pocket park. It's a very innovative partnership between Luna and the city of San Jose's uh, PRNS department and Department of Transportation. And as you heard, the project uh, met some roadblocks, so to speak. Uh, in trying to work out lease agreements with Caltrans. Happily, the city has recently signed a lease and is moving forward now with this important project with the city as grantee. Uh, construction of the Havana Midfield Pocket Park will be managed by the city, maintained as a city park, and the city is also in the process of acquiring the land from Caltrans. On August 26, just a few months ago, the Open Space Authority Board of Directors approved the transfer of the grant from Luna to the city of San Jose to oversee completion of the Pocket Park project. I wanna thank Council Member Esparza for attending the Open Space Authority Board of Directors meeting that evening and speaking to the dearth of open space and trees in her district and about how this small piece of open space has become such a source of pride to the neighborhood and to the community. We understand there remains a gap in the budget for constructing this project and with the passage of the resolution before you, the city can apply to the Open Space Authority under its 20% program for grant funds to help bridge this gap as soon as possible. We look forward to attending the ribbon cutting in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. And with that, I'd like to move approval. Second. Um, motion second. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco. Just, uh, I, I, I just wanted to congratulate Councilmember Esparza. Um, this, uh, what is it, a couple of days ago, my son's sitting in the, in the audience right now. Uh, he had a, a project that he had to introduce. Uh, he's uh, first year at De Anza and is taking a Chicano Studies class. And, uh, and I said, I have the perfect spot. And I took him straight to this beautiful mural. And seven years ago, when I first took office, I met with Luna and they took me to this little patch. And, uh, you, and, and this is what the east side has to work with. It's little patches like this little pocket park. East side is built out. We're paved over. We're a heat island. Uh, and and uh, wherever we can find a little piece of land, we, we either turn it into a park. And uh, of course, our city manager went on a tour with me. And I had the pleasure of uh, showing her that we have no land <laughs> to, <laughs> to create parks or, or plant trees. And so anything that we can get, we're, we're grateful for it uh, because that's just our reality. And so what you've done, Council Member Esparza, along with all of the partners, uh, truly is uh, a work of art. It was just such, I just invite everybody to go out there. It's such a beautiful mural. And my, I have pictures of my son taking pictures of the mural because it, it was, I love it when my children are inspired by what they see on the east side of San Jose. Again, we write our narrative, we get to write our headlines uh, versus having others uh, do it for us. And, and that, that is part of our narrative to see that kind of beauty on the east side of San Jose and take ownership of it. Thank you so much for doing that and allowing my children to have a sense of pride on the east side of San Jose. Right. 
That's hard. Any other comment? All right, let's vote. I don't think we took public comments on this one. I'm sorry. Have we? We haven't, Did have we? we? I, I just I just saw the uh, I saw the screen come up, so I reflexively sorry. was ready to vote. Let's go to public um, comment. Thank you, Tony. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, thank you, Tony Tabor, for, uh, very much. Uh, I wanted to speak on uh, redistricting item. Would this be the time to speak on that? No. All right, thank you. I will patiently wait. Uh, thank you. Tessa Wood Nancy. Okay, thank you so much for letting us speak on this item too. Um, yes, I'm very uh, happy at what's happening with the Open Space Authority giving money to the city to, or you know, to the nonprofit Luna to then give it to the city to buy that land. I guess they had to buy it um, or to develop it, whatever, wherever it was, they got $250,000 to do this transaction, which is wonderful. And it, I, I, I always thought that the Open Space Authority, when I've kind of contacted them or somebody um, about it, you know, that they don't do this like in, uh, inner, inner urban kind of land buying, but I'm just so happy that they did do this because this is where we need to make San Jose a garden again. We need to make the earth the garden again, but you know, it, it, it's one neighborhood at a time and just so happy that, you know, that the Open Space Authority sees the value of, you know, putting money into our urban core to create the, you know, to bring nature back in here because, you know, that's what we need to start doing is doing that so that people um, don't have to go up to Tahoe or, even out to the, you know, Coyote Valley, because that's usually driving a car out there, or, you know, there's no transit, and even our transit is in fossil fuel free. So, you know, and it's too far for a bicycle or whatever. And the thing is, is that, you know, this is where we need to make our, our city a garden again and make it beautiful to live here. And so that's where I was um, hoping that they would even help us um, to, to buy the land at 615 Stockton Avenue to, to, you know, which is open space. And we have also our problems of the pollution and, and how we need to take the open spaces and turn them into um, the valley, back into the Valley of Heart's Delight to deal with our ecological collapse, to bring the birds and bees and butterflies back, as well as to save ourselves. Back to the mayor. And we already had a vote before the comment that was 10-0 with Jimenez absent. Okay, would anyone like to change their vote in light of public comment? I'm not seeing anyone jump up. Uh, Councilman Crosco, I'm assuming that was from a prior comment. Okay, <laughs> so I'll clear that. Okay, uh, let's now take a motion on the remainder of the consent calendar. Move approval. Second. All right, any comments on any other items on consent? I would like to say that um, Council Member Jimenez just signed on, so we will need to take a roll call vote. Okay. And public comment on consent calendar as a whole, Tessa Wood Nancy. Um, I, I think there was another item. I really appreciate how you're putting up the signs about things. That really helps the uh, information about what we're talking about. Oh, um, yeah, you hear me? And so, really help that about that. So thank you, Tony, for doing that. And the only other comment I have about, you know, just issues of, uh, is really great if we had, you know, anybody who's talking or those type of things like titles, you know, in terms of our commissions and different like, things like that, that we notate not only their name, but their position in, in the city of San Jose. That would be very helpful um, to have that to educate us more. So anyway, getting back to the consent, I guess the issues that the one issue was, of course, the travel expenses as we put those into consent and we say, oh, you know, we just put that in. No big deal. We're not going to talk about it. And we do need to talk about it. We need to talk about our travel and, you know, we shouldn't be traveling. And that that's the, the reality is that we need to stay home and do our business from home. And that is, you know, we can do that. And that is the beauty. That's what COVID has shown us, that we can work remotely and it's very effective. And everybody is so much happier. Everyone I speak to that says they're working at home, how much they love it, how safer it is, how, how much, you know, they say it's really an equity issue for the disabled and the caregivers that it makes their life so much easier to be able to work at home. 
So when we, so in terms of the travel, we shouldn't be traveling. We should be doing our, our meetings remotely. And even I talked to MTC today when they said they were going to put a mandate for us all to work at home, anybody who could and make that uh, a requirement. But the, but the city, the big cities, San Francisco and San Jose, their mayors, you know, fought that because they want business as usual, people to come out. And, and, and so we, we're consumers, you know, and that's where they want us to keep consuming, to keep this economy going. But we need to transition our economy to become producers. That's, that's what we need to become is producers, self-sufficiency. And this is a transition to be able to work at home to help us become producers. Blair Bigman. Hi, thank you very much for allowing myself a uh, public comment on remainder of consent uh, items. Um, for item 2.16 yeah, is a- uh, Tony, actually, we already heard comment. On no, I, 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 I was speaking, I spoke on the item uh, on 2. Yeah. Okay, were there any other comments I heard yet on consent? Okay. All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. I hear a door. I know. <laughs> Cohen? Thank you. That's unanimous. Okay. Saved by a door. We're on to item. 3.1, which is the report of the city manager. Jennifer? Um, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to officially kick off our annual combined giving campaign. This year, our theme is give a little to help a lot. And it is very appropriate for the times that we're in. Now more than ever, we can provide a better day for people through dozens of essential programs that are funded through the city's annual combined giving campaign. And to give you an idea of, of our contributions, during last year's campaign, city employees donated $147,000, contributed over 3,200 hours of service, and donated over 175 items for our community. This year, we've set a goal of $155,000 and hope to increase volunteer hours and donated items by 5%. I just looked, uh, we just launched this morning and we've already, as of 2, 11 p.m., raised almost uh, $15,800 already and it's just been a few hours. So I really congratulate our employees for doing that. Um, and I wanna thank them all in advance. Uh, our, our campaign will be going on for a little while. I do wanna recognize our Fire Chief Robert Sapien Jr. and team members in the Fire Department for coordinating this year's campaign alongside the department coordinators who will lead each of our department's efforts. I also wanna thank the four foundations that partner with us, the United Way Bay Area, Creating Healthier Communities, America's Best Local Charities, and Earth Share of California. And now I'd like to invite Chief Sapien to say a few words. Thank you. Chief, could I ask if you could, I don't think, oh, the mic's not working. That's what's going on. How are we now? Much better. Okay, sorry about that. No thank, you, thank you, Jennifer, Mayor and Council. Uh, on behalf of uh, the entire fire department, we are excited to be coordinating this year's combined giving campaign. As you heard, uh, the theme of this year's campaign is give a little and uh, help a lot. Uh, and so we're excited to engage all of our fellow city employees this year towards uh, another successful campaign, uh, and we hope to reach and exceed our goal. So we just simply ask that all city employees look out for our communications as we will continue to uh, try to get the energy and excitement up for this year's campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Thanks for taking it on. Okay, anything further, Jennifer? No, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, unless there are any comments from my colleagues or from the public, let's move on. I have one hand up from Tessa Woodmancy. Okay. I'd like to remind the public speakers, this is just on the report, which was camp combined giving campaign. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you, Tony. Yes, the combined giving campaign. Well, the city manager's report, and just you know, was thinking about the city manager, and and as we are looking at the decisions about whether or not to have a strong mayor or city manager, that's just an issue that I was going to address. But I guess you want me to stay focused on the their giving campaign, which is a good work of the city manager, and wanted to thank her for that. You know, to create <laughs> create that campaign. However, you know, we need to look at that. That's one of the major issues we're looking at. What is the role? You know, do we have a strong mayor or do we have a strong city manager? And the one issue, you know, is, is that, you know, how we're running our city. And, you know, maybe it could be better than a city manager. You know, and one of the issues that um, I was saying is that, you know, we, you know, we should really have our public comment in the beginning of the meeting. And who decides that? You know, that, that, you know, what are the protocols? Like, here's a good example of something that's good. The city manager's creating a giving campaign. That's, that's nice. But, you know, what are the other protocols? Like, for instance, when we have public comment in our meeting, is that, is that something that the city council decides, you know, when we have that? We need protocols uh, um, that, you know, would establish good de democratic principles. And it might be more something from a, a staff position versus, you know, elected officials that, you know, change over every four years and that we have policies in place of when our, a, a critical policy, which is when is our public comment in our city council meeting? And that, that, that could be ad essentially addressed potentially from the city manager, you know, who, you know, and just creating protocols versus at the whims of the po politicians. And so that, those are just issues that, you know, I'm looking at as we, you know, we're facing that with our charter review commission, you know, should we have a strong mayor or a strong city manager and, and going to the vote? So we really need to be looking at policies in this and learn more about the different roles. Back to the mayor. On item 3.3, which is the pandemic response and community and economic recovery. Nope, I'm sorry, we just deferred that. Uh, 3.4 is the federal immigration reform. Let's have that one instead. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. I'm Sulma Maciel, I'm the Director of the Office of Racial Equity. And I am joined by um, my wonderful team, Chris Cambises, the Immigrant Affairs Manager, and Andrea Trong, the Racial Equity Manager. So um, as initiated by Councilmember Esparza in October and as recommended by the Rules and Open Government Committee on October 20th, 21, um, we are here to ask the council to adopt a resolution calling on Congress to preserve funding for the pro-immigrant policies, including a path to citizenship in the federal budget resolution and urging Congress and the president to pass a path to citizenship policy. And as such, we are here to, to request adoption of said resolution. As you know, this immigration policy and this, um, th this situation is very fluid at the moment and bill provisions are rapidly evolving. Uh, but I wanna thank Alex Felton from the, from the Intergovernmental Relations Office, as well as the lobbyist, um, our federal lobbyist, to continue to communicate the city's priorities to congressional delegation and leadership. And I thought I would take an opportunity to also provide a state of play. Uh, this is evolving quickly. Um, and so a, a quick update on the, um, on immigration is that on October 20th, President Biden announced a $1.85 trillion legislative framework for a potential budget reconciliation bill. The framework included $100 billion to improve and reform the immigration system, consistent with the Senate's rec reconciliation rules. The framework also referenced immigration provisions that would make enhancements to reduce green card backlogs, expand legal representation, and make the asylum and border processing more efficient and humane. The Senate parliamentarian, the Senate's nonpartisan rules referee, has twice ruled against the inclusion of a pathway to citizenship in a reconciliation bill. So Plan A would have provided a pathway to citizenship for a wide range of undocumented immigrants, including dreamers and essential workers, Plan B would have updated the registry date to allow certain undocumented individuals who have been in the country up to 2010 to adjust to permanent status. This week, Senate Democrats are working to submit their Plan C on immigration before the parliamentarian. 
and this is reported to be an effort to offer humanitarian parole or temporary protection from deportation, as well as work authorization to undocumented individuals who have been in the country up to 2010. Humanitarian parole would not provide a pathway to citizenship and would be a temporary status similar to TPS. It is not clear whether Democrats will also include provisions to address the green card backlog and related legal immigration reform on this third submission or how the parliamentarian will rule on any of it. Regardless of the final outcome of the budget reconciliation process, it is critical that we continue to advocate strongly for other ongoing legislation that seeks to provide pathways to citizenship and immigration reform. The Office of Racial Equity has been actively working with legislative and CBO partners over the last six months to support bills such as the Citizenship for Essentials Worker Act, America's Children Act, the American Dream and Promise Act, and the Dream Act of 2021. At this point, I welcome your questions. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Esparza? I think we have some public comment. Here. Great. Let's go to the public. Eileen Rodriguez. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, as we all know, the pandemic is, you know, really difficult. And um, I think that all undocumented folks, such as farm workers, janitors, and essential workers, such as security officers as well, worked really, really hard throughout this pandemic. And they deserve the pathway to citizenship because they contribute to the economy and other civil duties like any other citizen does. Um, and with that being said, um, I hope you support this and I hope we could get um, much more support on this uh, uh, immigration reform. Thank you. Jose Pav Pavon. Good afternoon, uh, San Jose Council members. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Pavon. I'm uh, the lead political organizer for SEIU. USWW, and um, we have thousands of members in the city of San Jose in our union alone um, who are immigrants. And we, we wanna uh, give a heartfelt thanks to uh, Maya Sparsas, council member Maya Sparsas office um, for uh, uh, pushing this resolution forward. We wanna give a, a a respectful acknowledgement to um, Siren and uh, Maricela Gutierrez for helping us uh, uh, draft the legislation and co-sponsoring the, the, not legislation, the resolution, I'm sorry. And, um, and we wanna say that uh, our union supports a pathway to legalization for 11 million people um, uh, who are undocumented uh, currently in the US today. Um, we, we support, um, you know, of course, uh, prioritizing essential workers, um, fighting for uh, people in the DACA program and the TPS program, farm workers, um, but we also want to extend the ask to ask the federal government and Congress to, to create a pathway of legalization for 11 million undocumented people. Um, immigrants not only contribute to the economy, but uh, low-wage labor acts as a form of investment in the economy that is essential to economic growth and to sustaining uh, strong uh, GDP. And immigrants throughout the history of this country have consistently helped the economy grow and move forward. And we need their help now. And so we, we want them to get what they deserve, uh, uh, a pathway to citizenship. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Esparza. Tessa Woodmancy. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, federal immigration reform. This is really important in regards to the last thing I was referring to. When we're talking about public um, public comment in the beginning of the meeting. Uh, the spotlight, the San Jose spotlight had interviewed, because we've been dealing with this. We, a lot of citizens want this to make it easy for us to communicate with our, our elected officials. You just come at a certain time, you know, it's in the beginning of the meeting. It's like six o'clock, you know, you know, time. You don't have to wait till midnight where they're going to maybe give you a half hour, 30, I mean, a half a second to talk. So anyway, the, you know, it's interesting that what Mayor Licardo responded is that, oh, people will start talking about Donald Trump. 
you know, and here we are. Uh, and and that, that was, you know, like we'd be off topic, quote unquote. And here we are addressing the federal federal um, legislation. And of course, we're all interconnected. And we even have, the, I was just looking up, Alex, this guy, Alex, who's our federal, you know, what, intergovernmental relations. And we have our state, you know, advocacy. You know, we have that. We're actually paying people to communicate with the federals and the state. It's very essential. And to say, oh, that people will talk about federal issues and, and you know, be off topic. It's not off topic. We're all connected. And, and the things that happen at the federal level do affect us, as we're seeing in this, you know, federal immigration reform request. So this is where that is a, a false argument to say that people will talk about federal issues because we do need to be able to talk about it and they do impact us. So I appreciate, you know, Maya Esparza bringing this issue up and saying that this is critical and that, you know, the immigration reform issues and how they impact our, our local citizens affects us. So this is another reason to have the public speaking. That, that, that was a false argument that Mayor Licardo gave to say why we don't have it in the beginning. And so this is where we need to really look at our structure, our, our charter, and say that public comment should be in the beginning of the meeting and for all. At this time, we still have about 10 hands up. Next speaker up, Lina Nguyen. Hi, my name is Lena and I'm an immigrant rights youth fellow at SIRN. I'd like to say hello and thank you council members, members for an opportunity to speak I'm from the east side, specifically District 7 is where I'm from. I'm concerned about the exclusion in the new proposal and Democrats promised a pathway to citizenship for all 11 million undocumented immigrants. And it is concerning to see that the new proposal is excluding many immigrants. And we have here, we have an immigrant community and a strong immigrant protection in San Jose. We must continue to support all immigrants and the only way to solve the immigration problem is to include everyone. I stand with the immigrant community because my parents are refugees from Vietnam and I watched them sacrifice a lot to give me and my siblings a better life. And I ask that we be inclusive of everybody and make the proposal include all 11 million. Thank you. Maricela Gutierrez. Maricela? Okay, we're gonna move on to Araceli. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak on this issue and thank you to council member Esparza for this um, immigration resolution proposal. And just, it might sound a little redundant, but as we know, um, you know, the nation is home to 11 million undocumented folks. And most of those folks did work throughout the pandemic. They, they're still working now. They weren't able to get time off. And as someone who was also born and raised in San Jose, I, I, I resonate with the, with, the, with the struggle of having immigrant parents that are constantly um, living out of fear, fear whether they're going to get deported or not. And there's a lot of children in, in San Jose that also live with that fear that their parents might, might be taken away. And when their parents contribute to the economy, when they, they, they pay their taxes, you know, they, they try to stay as, as low key as possible to not to stay out of trouble. And it's just something that is owed to the undocumented community, just a pathway to citizenship. It's been talked about in past administrations. It's, it's a, the talk now with this current administration, but there's no moving forward, you know, like there's always all these promises to the undocumented community, but they're never given a permanent pathway to citizenship. So if you guys, if the council could please support Maya Sparsa's um, proposal, that would be great. And thank you, council member Sparsa. Mary Anna Cazares. Hello, my name is Mariana, and I'm here to support the, the item 3.3. I want to support uh, the mayor's proposal, the mayor's in San Jose, San Ricardo uh, proposal of, to fund a tutoring program using American Rescue Plan dollars 
So I'm here uh, thinking to the council members to to give room to discussion for this other item also. So thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot uh, for this item. Uh, it's been um, a long journey. Uh, these same issues were brought up about uh, seven years ago uh, under the Obama administration. Um, they were really good ideas then, and they're really good ideas now. Good luck how we can move forward with this issue. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation on this issue. I think it covered a lot of ground, and it described a lot of ways to talk about uh, this issue uh, very well. And uh, I found a great... Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, city staff report how to just how to address and discuss this issue. Um, to talk about the future of border issues um, just opens up, you know, not only the importance of, of of working with ourselves within this country, but how to address the future of of Mexico and the U.S. itself in the in our future. So, uh, a great item. Thank you for its discussion, and good luck to all of us. Uh, Man, hopefully this is a time we can be moving forward. Thank you. Call in user one. I don't think the city is prepared to take on tens of thousands of people crossing the border illegally. They're, from, they're not just from Mexico, they're from many different countries. And they're going to require housing, health care, education, jobs. Where are we going to put everybody? I mean, it's not a matter of, like, having it. We don't have it. And, I mean, this is a city that can't even, you know, have the fountain at the Rose Garden work properly. You guys get upset if I raise my voice or use the wrong gender pronoun. How are you going to handle real-life issues of people coming in the city with nothing, clothes on their back. And, you know, my grandfather was an immigrant. My, my sister-in-law was an immigrant. They both had a lot of struggle with immigration uh, people. My grandfather was quarantined. His uh, mother, my great-grandma, didn't even know where he was. He was quarantined in Ellis Island. No one knew where he was. Can you imagine? Because he was sick and he was ill and they needed to quarantine him. My sister-in-law spent tens of thousands of dollars to become a citizen. She still has a green card. She'll have her citizenship soon, but she worked very hard to do that. And her and my brother spent a boatload of money and, and interviews and everything else. And for people just to waltz in and say, hey, where's all my free stuff? And, yeah, I deserve to be a citizen right away. I disagree. Now, people have been working. No, eh, those people should be fast-tracked. But if people just show up, uh -uh, I don't agree with that. And don't forget about Bambi Larson. Don't forget about her. She was uh, murdered by uh, uh, an illegal or undocumented person. He had been arrested and detained numerous times. And on the sixth or seventh. Krista De La Torre. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Krista De La Torre, and I am here on behalf of the South Bay Labor Council to support council member as far as his federal immigration reform resolution. It is incumbent upon the Biden administration to fulfill their campaign promises and their Build Back Better agenda by providing a clear and direct pathway to citizenship. There are over 25,000 undocumented immigrants in San Jose who are our neighbors, friends, classmates, coworkers. Many of them are frontline workers, and all of them are fellow taxpayers. Um, these folks perform many of the essential duties and work in our communities, like providing health care services to our most vulnerable residents. Um, during the pandemic, we saw the extent of the struggles our undocumented community face on a daily basis. Many undocumented families assumed high health risks, working tirelessly on the front lines, provide vital resources to our community, and safeguard our health, all while living in the fear of deportation. It is high time they receive the path to citizenship that they have been so long denied. Um, currently, the Senate parliamentarian is blocking efforts to pass comprehensive immigration reform, including a pathway to citizenship for our nation's 11 million um, undocumented immigrants. Uh, and we have a supportive presidential administration right now, so we really have 
this historic opportunity to act now and break through decades of political impasse and actually accomplish um, some immigration reform that could benefit many of our undocumented folks here in the United States. So today I ask the council to urge our congressional and presidential leadership to take bold and aggressive and immediate action on immigration reform. Um, right now there is a, or there's been a recent federal ruling on DACA in Texas and it's called into the question the future of, um, of the program and we need to really act um, urgently. So we might not have a better chance right now to improve the lives of millions of hardworking immigrants, all of them who have taken enormous risks and faced unfathomable hardships to build a better life and future for themselves and their children. So again, I ask the council to urge our- Brian. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with a con uh, congressperson, sorry, maybe later. Um, uh, the uh, two things put forward by the council person and Mayor Lucardo. I didn't read all of them, so I'm talking a little bit from what was said. I just want one thing really that should be really clear. People who've worked through the pandemic, people who are undocumented and have put in or or able to should be, uh, there should be a clear path. What's the expectations? It shouldn't be a political football like it seems to be. But within that population, whatever group, um, there are people who take advantage of these people who are already afraid because of their potential of being deported so that people who have committed violent crimes and are let out of the uh, justice system don't come back into the country and commit more violent crimes. I'm not trying to say that in an unkind way. You know, there's other, there's some crimes that are like, you're taking stuff because you're hungry. You know, I mean, I don't know how to say it. I don't have all the, the, vocab you know to try to make it really clear it's just that i don't want to see these people who, have, who are trying to become citizens taken more advantage of is what i'm trying to say and it's just really important to make people wait down there so long or to have to cross those dangerous places and to arrest people who's just trying to give them water i mean i know we need quote unquote secure borders but it doesn't have to be cruel so it's not an easy thing but it should be really built into it that people who are violent and people who are who take advantage and people who steal and all of that, you know, lots of stuff. People who uh, commit fraud and that take advantage of other people's situations, um, that should be uh, looked at too. Thank you. Azusena Nava. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Azusena and I organize with Services Immigrant Rights and Education Network, SIREN. I'm also the constituent of District 7 and daughter of immigrants living in San Jose. I'm calling in support of all 11 million undocumented immigrants, which is not necessarily reflected in the resolution to call on Congress to preserve funding for pro-immigrant policies, including a pathway to citizenship. It's discriminatory to exclude anyone based on criminalizing labels that are historically harmful. Our families want to continue working without fear of family separation or deportation from this country. Asking for 11 million is not asking for too much. Many of our immigrant community members that are excluded have been waiting for a pathway for far too long. Um, this includes my family and we can no longer wait. And quite fr frankly, waiting time is over. We're at a crucial junction to pass a long overdue pathway to citizenship. And we need as much support as possible to urge Congress to take a bold action. Um, your voice, city council members, and support will make a difference. Um, please pass this resolution to echo the voices of community members like me who know that we need citizenship for everyone, not just some of us. Um, thank you. Jose Servin. Hi. Uh, my name is Jose Servin, and I'm calling as an organizer with SIREN, the services, um, yeah, SIREN, the organization, um, and I'm calling to speak on behalf of item number 3.4. Um, in particular, um, as a longtime organizer in the immigrant rights field, I would like to give my testimony also as an undocumented father and um, the child of undocumented workers to say that we are not a monolith. Um, and so a lot of the labels that are coming up on this call today actually represent us. And I have no shame in saying that my family has been criminalized at the same time that my family is a working family and we're laborers. Um, and so for that reason, I would strongly, strongly encourage um, the council members who brought forward this bold proposal to make it bolder and to include all 11 million people in this country. 
If you look at the numbers, even under the strongest proposal brought forth by the Democrats, um, we would only have about half of the undocumented population in California benefit from any sort of um, pathway to citizenship. And so I think it, we owe it to our community members, we owe it to our undocumented neighbors um, to fight for more and to continue to fight for more, especially at a moment when we have the historic opportunity of having power in, in, um, in the White House, having power in the House and having power in the Senate. Um, and so our words matter. Um, our words matter a lot. Um, we saw this happen. We saw the power of words the past four years um, in terms of criminalizing, um, brutalizing, um, and stratifying our community and making us the scapegoat for whatever problem you want to name. Immigrants were named the problem. And so I think it's time for us to be bold on the counter, right, to uphold our immigrant communities, uphold our values, um, and to really be inclusive of everybody. Because unfortunately, the people being left out are the people that need help the most. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Maricela. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Maricela Gutierrez. I'm the Executive Director of Services, Immigrant Rights and Education Network, also known as SIREN. SIREN's been in serving the San Jose community, Santa Clara County for 35 years. And um, through these 35 years, we've served everyone regardless of immigration status, criminal status, or where they come from. And it's been an honor for me to do this role these past six years. Um, the resolution, we're very excited that the resolution is being pushed forward. We know that a pathway to citizenship is very much needed to the millions of, 11 millions of community members that reside in the United States and also San Jose being one of the, the largest counties with immigrants in the Bay Area. We know that not only is this uh, important, it's as a sim sim symbolic gesture, but also important to show to our community that we stand with them. Currently, the language is still limiting because it does only include essential workers, TPS, DACA, and farm workers. It excludes a number of a million, millions of people. So it only includes about 5 million individuals. We're pushing for all 11 million. So we re ask you to reconsider the language to actually expand it to include all 11 million um, to assure that our community is not, is not left out. The communities are all included. Um, in a county where we have the, the strongest sanctuary policies in the, in, in the country, you know, with a civil detainer policy that protects immigrants, we want to assure that this um, symbolic uh, resolution also represents that's for our communities. And, um, and as an organization that went out and hit, up, hit, the, hit, the, hit the streets, was on phone banking, was uh, calling and texting almost 600,000 people to turn out to vote in the 2020 elections, we know that it's important for our our democracy and for the democratic government currently in office to also take a stand for immigrants. And for this reason, we're asking to reconsider the language that's currently being proposed in the resolution to be inclusive of all 11 million. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Council. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I think the conversation we have to at least get to a point where we can accept the fact that we have been dependent upon the exploitation of the immigration laws. And we have been the beneficiaries of that because we continue to maintain through generations this exploitation of the body, the exploitation of the where, where a person can live, actually exercising powers where a human being can live because of the poverty that they're experiencing because they're not getting a just wage nor just respect and honor for the labor that they produce that built this country to begin with. So I think that the start point for the conversation needs to start there. The humanization and acknowledgement of this country that they have continued to exploit and to enrich themselves off of the exploitation of the Mexican, of the Honduran, of the Salvadorian, of the Peruvian, and all of the citizens in these cities that also suffer from poverty. Poverty that is created. We have not challenged ourselves to discuss the red line policies and how those red line policies were informed by much of the language that I heard today. Brian, the reason why it was hard for you to describe what you were describing, because they are not your words. I can tell, I can sense it, I can hear it. Don't do that again. It's really unbecoming of you. But to the topic, we need to start discussing 
these uh, federal immigration reform laws within the context of us understanding that we have been the beneficiaries of the exploitation of them. Back to the mayor. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Siren, SEIU, and other advocates like the Asian Law Alliance who advocate for our immigrants every day. Um, I brought this forward because I think San Jose, as the 10th largest city in the country, has a responsibility to speak up on this nationwide issue, but also this is a local issue. 25,000 undocumented immigrants are in our community. They are our residents. And the timing of this is really important. We're at a crucial time in our nation in terms of immigration reform at the federal level. We have literally a once in a generation opportunity to enact reform and create a pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants who are our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family. And they are also many of our essential workers who have put themselves in harm's way to keep our society running during this pandemic. So many of them have worked tirelessly to build a better life for themselves and their children and to achieve the American dream. And let there be no doubt, they are an integral part of our community here in San Jose. COVID-19 has laid bare the stark inequities that existed long before the pandemic. And of course, we know that the same five east side zip codes that have faced the worst of the public health and economic effects of the pandemic, those are 95122, 95116, 95127, 95121, and 95111. Those are also five of our zip codes with the large in, in, largest immigrant communities. I also wanted to add that we've seen during the Trump administration, even before COVID, um, I had kids in the schools in my council district that were afraid to go to school because they weren't sure if mom and dad would be home when they got back. And so this was a big issue before COVID where teachers and principals were talking to kids and families, and it's a legitimate fear. We've seen it during COVID when people who needed food most were frankly afraid to go get food. We had to work to convince people, please come and get food because we have an immigration system that penalizes people um, from coming out of the shadows. It penalizes people from getting help. So a lot of folks have also been isolated during COVID. We know that one in six children in California is the child of an undocumented immigrant. So those fears carried into whole families. And during COVID, I would go out into the neighborhoods and into our communities and just see the fear and the anxiety that families were living with on top of everything else. And for folks that aren't sure, that made comments about waltzing in anywhere, first off, I would know that many people would say that the border crossed us. But more than that, I would invite folks to learn about the immigration system and learn that nobody waltzes anywhere. It's a Byzantine, difficult system to work in. And all we're asking for is a legal pathway to citizenship. So now we face a rare opportunity for Congress and the president to approve comprehensive immigration reform through the federal budget process. And this comes as a recent federal ruling in Texas on DACA has thrown the future of the program in doubt. And so the time to act is now. We need to send a unified message to our leaders in Congress that this once in a generation opportunity will not pass us by and so that we need comprehensive immigration reform that includes a pathway to citizenship. Before I make a motion, I wanted to mention to folks the first paragraph of the resolution mentions there are 11 undocumented immigrants nationwide. Um, hearing the concerns that were brought up today, that's completely new to me, by the way, I hadn't heard those concerns. I'm, 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 this is all about preparing a pathway to citizenship. I'm happy to amend 
item number one to say calls on Congress to act through the budget reconciliation process to ensure a pathway to citizenship for all 11 million undocumented, comma, streamers, DACA holders, et cetera, and item one to make that edit. With that, I move to approve. Thank you. I support the motion. Um, I just, uh, <laughs> sorry, Councilmember Manners, I think Councilmember Crosco beat you to it. Um, just had a couple quick questions. One is, I know that Senator Padilla has been very clear and on the record he's going to push through reconciliation, but I know there are challenges based on the parliamentarians ruling. So do we want to make this open so that we can get, make this relevant to successive efforts to try to get some uh, reform over the goal line in Congress in case we're again blocked from doing so under reconciliation. Mayor, are you saying that we should add additional language that reflects yeah, that? Anything yeah. that might just say and any future efforts. Sure. I, I don't know. I just. It seems to me there may be some real procedural obstacles here that we won't be able to overcome. Yes. Yeah, we can add that language and as part of the resolution. Yeah, I sure. just suggest it. Um, so that way it's real clear and on the record. Okay. Um, is that right with the make of the motion? Yes. Okay. And the second is? Yes. Okay, great. And then, you know, I, I remember hearing the number, you know, when referring to the number of our neighbors who are undocumented here in San Jose, I remember hearing the number 80,000. Uh, mentioned in the past um, and I'm trying to understand why we're at 25,000 now because I, I thought 25,000 might reflect the number of folks who might be eligible under DACA but I thought there was a much larger number of our neighbors who might be who might be undocumented the over 80,000 number is those that are eligible to become citizens they're legal permanent residents so over 80,000 legal permanent residents that are eligible to become citizens. And so part of the citizenship efforts for trying to get them to move into that path. Okay, I thought we That's actually had number. many more San Jose residents who are actually not citizens than just 80,000. So I guess maybe I'm, I'm under a misunderstanding because I'm pretty certain that the city has put out information yeah. saying that we have 80,000 undocumented neighbors in our city. And you're saying that's not, that's not no, the number. It's over 83,000 legal permanent residents, as far as I know. That's where okay. that number comes from. Okay. And the undocumented has shifted over the last several years. It's really difficult to identify, pin that number. Right. But Chris, I don't know if you have the latest numbers, but we've been working oh. with foundations to try to get a more accurate yeah. number. Yeah. I'll just add that I think one of the, the, um, sort of malleable areas is that oftentimes the number is is shifts based on whether we're referring to how many are in the city specifically, how many are in Santa Clara County, how many are in the San Jose metropolitan area, right. and I think that's where it gets a little bit squishy sometimes because I know we've tried to nail okay. down that number specifically so that we can reflect the the appropriate number. So that so might be where some of that. So our best are. estimate is twenty five thousand. Okay, it's helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item 5.1, finally, are actions related to temporary financial relief and the amendments to the agreements for the tenants at Mineta International. John, thank you for your patience. Um, and th there is no presentation. Uh, let's go first to members of the public, if they'd like to speak. Um, I have Elmer Juco and Sarah McDermott who are present, please come to the microphone in no particular order. So whoever's first, just come straight to the microphone. I currently have one hand up on Zoom. If you wanna speak on this item, 5.1 related to airport tenants, 
please raise your hand at this time. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elmer Hooker. I am a cook at the San Jose Airport. I have worked at the airport for eight years now, and I am proud to be a member of Local 19. I'm here to speak in support of the memo from Council Member Esparza and Council Member Cohen and Council Member Jimenez. Thank you for making sure airport workers are being heard and for evaluating equity issues at the airport. We take pride in being the first people to greet visitors to our city and providing a great guest experience. It's been a long road to recovery for the airport and for us. So thank you again for making sure we are part of the recovery process. On behalf of my fellow airport workers, we look forward to being part of this ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sarah McDermott. I'm the political director of Unite Here Local 19. And I'd like to thank council members Esparza, Cohen, and Jimenez for their memo regarding airport workers. We are in full support of this proposal. Workers at the airport are primarily people of color from the communities that have been hardest hit by COVID. Airport workers felt the brunt of the shutdown and are still struggling in the slow recovery process. Thank you for putting an equity lens on the airport and giving workers a voice. We look forward to our members and, uh, and other organizations that work, represent workers at the airport being uh, able to be part of this ongoing conversation. Thank you. I currently have five hands up, Paul Soto. The dehumanization that I don't think anybody does intentionally, but the dehumanization of hearing from a Caucasian speak and say that, well, you know, the we have at the airport people that work there, that, and most of them, there's a lot of them that are people of color. And so what we're going to do now, they're after ones that say that, how wonderful these systems are because they help these people of color. I'm not a person of color, I'm a Chicano. And, and the city is, is creating this normalization of dehumanization with respect to talking about issues that are class and race based. And I think this is a prime example of that because you're having this class wars for a limited amount of resources and space that we all know is going to happen on an even shorter timetable in terms of what has to do in terms of the manifest destiny point 2.0 and the taking over of the land and extracting people from it willingly or unwillingly through the process of poverty creation because that's going to squeeze the person because they can't serve their survival instincts any longer under a context that was created by every single one of these towers in District 3. Now, the airport has been asking this city for resources to help them remove those people from that land at Columbus because they are going to lose out $10 million. Okay, so the homeless are worth a lot of money. And this has everything to do with the airport, but yet they're going to come here and ask my tax dollars. But yet we're going in their direction. I suggest they practice a little bit, at least a little bit of stuff. Louise Auerhahn. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor City Council. Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships. And I wanted to speak in support of the memo from council members Jimenez, Cohen, and Esparza uh, to look at the workers who support the airport and keep them run, keep it running, and have been some of the hardest and longest hit by the after effects of COVID. Uh, we have looked at all of the industries and occupations within Santa Clara County, and hospitality and tourism is the one where the working people have still not been able to recover 
and are suffering the most and in many cases have been excluded from much of the assistance that's available to businesses, large and small, but is not available to working people. Um, so as we work towards actually get supporting our airport and getting it up and running again, I urge you to move forward with this memo and look at how can we make sure that as we bring, bring our airport back that we're also bringing back the people who worked there and built it and kept it running for so many years and want to keep our community running. Thank you very much. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, previous words and uh, public comment. Um, I wanted to try to quickly offer that uh, to speak on, to, on a few consumer issues. The consumer uh, ALPR data collection program uh, within the city airport area, I think has been a very good one. Uh, you know, their data collection used to be at a year and I think they're bringing it down to six months uh, that they hold on to data uh, from, they collect from, from ALPRs. I think it could be a good example for, uh, you know, downtown parking issues and just overall, you know, issues uh, for San Jose. And it just really addresses the concepts of uh, open democracy and uh, good practices and civil rights and civil protections that invites everyone to participate and, and try to uh, better themselves with. And I think that's really needed right now in our lives and can really help the uh, current AI questions that's going on in San Jose and, and in Bay Area cities uh, throughout the Bay Area at this time. And uh, it's just a real positive way to talk about our sustainability and our hopes and our good ideals and uh, so I just thought I'd mention it this time and uh, thanks for the item. Tessa Woodmancy. Hi, yes, Tessa Woodmancy. Well, I do wanna ask Paul Soto um, in regards to that $10 million. And I've been trying to find out the real history of what happened with the um, homeless at, at um, Columbus Park, because I know that it's sort of been um, taken out of the news what the real history is and it is about the money that the city of San Jose could get to expand the airport is what's threatened and and so you know there's a lot of issues there but the you know and, and, you know I guess it's a big issue you know it's that it's the fact that we having to move people in a place that's actually very hospitable to people people have really created community there and it's you know where our you know our civilization is started by the rivers and you know we should be providing um, that should become a you know a, an eco village. It could become an eco village. There's, I mean, but I guess you know there's contracts that we got rid of everybody from that area. You know, my neighbors have fought the the airport coming to that area because of what happened. That we moved a whole community. That was a Columbus Park was a neighborhood, and we got rid of those people. Uh, and I guess we gave them some little token of money, but you know, and and you know we lost that neighborhood. And so, you know, for the airport, and this is where we have, you know, um, you know, capitalism has exploited people and nature for profit. And, and when we look at what's happened, you know, what the, the people that are suffering are the, you know, the business, we shouldn't be subsidizing businesses. These businesses didn't make it. The airport didn't make it. The restaurants didn't make it. Well, then they should go away because we need to think about a new way of, of living and it most is based on the universal basic income so we can be healthy and try to move towards self-sufficiency. That's what we need to have, that universal basic income. We don't have to sell our souls, get sick from COVID. Jose Pavon. Hi, good afternoon. San Jose Council members, this is uh, Jose Luis Pavon. Uh, senior political organizer with SEIU USWW. Um, we would, uh, on, you know, on behalf of our of our union, uh, we we have we also have uh, mem we represent members at the San Jose Airport, and we want to uh, thank uh, Maya Sparza and uh, Council Member Cohen and Council Member Jimenez as well uh, for putting forward the memo, um, and we believe that. Uh, you know, uh, essential workers at the airport uh, deserve uh, uh, their fair share of the federal dollars that are coming down for COVID relief. And uh, our workers who are out there on the front, <clears throat> the front lines, um, uh, 
uh, risking their lives um, and to make sure that the airport continued to run and and we feel like they they need some some economic uh, support and relief and just a fair share of you know all all the uh, the wealth and the, and the and the profit economic activity that's generated by the airport. We believe that our workers leave a fair, uh, deserve a fair increase in, in wages and benefits. Uh, thank you very much. Araceli Rueda. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, so, kind of like the same that everyone has been asking for. Um, I'm a political organizer with SEIU USWW and our union does have members in San Jose City Airport that, um, that have been working there that did get affected by the pandemic. So it's crucial for them to have their, their wages and benefits increased. Um, and so I call on you to support the budget memo by council member Arenas and Esparza, especially you know, making sure that at least 1.5 million workers um, have the proper funding and and are able to access um, just all these benefits that are that would be included with with the federal funding. Thank you. Back to the mayor. Thank you. Uh, returning to council, <clears throat> council member Spartan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, we all understand what an incredibly challenging uh, 18 months this has been for our airport and all the businesses that we rely on to make the San Jose airport what it is. And so I'm happy to support the recommendations from staff that enables us to continue and to support these businesses. Uh, however, I just wanted to add that for each of these businesses that has struggled this past year and a half, we know that their workers have been struggling to survive as well. Many of these workers, as we all know, were laid off at the beginning of the pandemic and continue to face extreme financial hardship. And so one of the things I like to do, to do is to know more about the issues and challenges our workers are facing so that we can figure out how to address the need. Many of the airport workers and hospitality workers live in San Jose. Many of them live in District 3 and District 5 and District 7 especially. Um, but that's essentially why in the memo that I submitted with Councilmember David Cohen, Councilmember Sergio Jimenez, to request that staff return to CED committee with an evaluation of the challenges faced by our airport workers, including reevaluating our airport living wage policy, especially in light of the immense challenges these workers have faced. These workers are disproportionately people of color. They live in the same communities and zip codes that have suffered the worst effects of the pandemic. And so this is our effort to ensure that their voices and concerns are heard it's a crucial matter of equity, and that's why we want to see this report come to CED. So with that, I'd like to move the memo um, written by Councilmember Jimenez, Cohen, and myself. Second. All right, motion second. Um, John, sorry to drag you down here, but while you're coming down, let me just say a big thank you. I know you're making some very, very tough decisions in your leadership in this time uh, at the airport, and I appreciate your continued leadership. I wanted to just ask about the issue of, of living wage versus what I understand many employees who are working on the premises to be actually under union contract. So can you just sort of, just so that we in the public are all clear, sort of which, which employees are subject to collective bargaining agreement and which will be subject to living wage requirements? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, John Aiken, Director of Aviation. Um, the concession employees for the food and beverage and the retail stores, the vast majority of them are uh, union employees that have a collective bargaining agreement. So airport living wage doesn't affect them. And uh, within those groups, um, everyone that was laid off at the beginning of the COVID pandemic was put on a list for rehire. They've gone through the list twice and all of those people have refused the job twice. We're currently short 45 employees just to get our concessions to open up from four in the morning, you know, until 10, 11 o'clock at night. 
the concessionaires are actually offering two to three dollars an hour more than is required by the union agreement to try and entice people to work. And additionally, they're giving them uh, sign on bonuses and retention bonuses to try and keep the staff there. That's part of the reason for the additional cost of them, you know, operating their business is they're doing more to try and get the people to work there. Airport living wage in general will take care of the under wing providers, the people that throw the bags for the airlines and do those kind of tasks um, are contract employees that are normally covered by living wage. So that's kind of the, the split at the airport. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. All right, any co other questions? All right, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Prosco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lepardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, on to public forum. Open forum. I have no cards in person. Um, I have Blair Beekman followed by Gail Osmer. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. A real quick meeting today. Wow, congratulations. Um, I guess uh, uh, first to note to continue good mask use. Um, you know, COVID has been rising in, in England and in Russia. It's always good to be considered, uh, to be considering good mask use through the holidays. Um, and, and good luck in, in, in that we're starting to work with a vaccine process with small children. Uh, good luck in the ways that we can learn to better talk about the vaccine process overall. I, I hope we can all make the efforts. Uh, what is its good points, its bad points, and uh, our lifestyles with, with it in our future. Um, with a minute 30, um, I guess uh, from uh, our exchange earlier today, uh, the, the mayor doesn't necessarily pay, play favorites. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, speak on item 2.9 about the issues of uh, the uh, reimagine, or not the reimagine, but the redistricting ideas that I felt were, I, I really like the person that may be becoming the new uh, head commissioner of the commission. And um, I'm really interested in redistricting ideas, how they can be, um, the, the, the items of C3, the community uh, maps are, are interesting to myself. If we learn to include all of what's currently D5 into the future of those maps, they possibly can be adjusted. Their adjustments may be easier to make. It's just easier to look at. Um, but there's real concerns from the Unity people that uh, um, the, co the community maps are not uh, speaking to certain uh, populations. Certain populations are gonna be cut out in certain districts that I think needs to be uh, much more talked about. And, uh, but w I think, you know, we are, there can be ways to, to, to lessen that and uh, lessens it, its worries. And I will speak, I guess, at Rules and Open Government tomorrow that I think there needs to be a, a, a more of a uh, consistent way we talk about, uh, you know, the, 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 the policy. Gail Osmer, followed by John Falkenberg. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's been a week now since I went to city council um, to let everybody know that phase three needs porta potties. Um, it shouldn't take a week for porta potties. I was out there today and um, it is a disaster. Um, I've talked to a few women and women now are peeing in a bucket because they don't have porta potties. It's very simple. Get on the phone, call United, get eight porta potties and hand washing stations out there. And if that's not enough, get more. It's a very simple process. If they don't know how to do it, I have suggested they call the person, the wonderful person who was in charge of it last year and the year before, who knows exactly what to do. I don't want to wait. They don't want to wait a week for porta potties. They need porta potties. There should be no excuses. It's been a week. And also, um, Mayor Licardo, I know you're busy, but <clears throat> I asked you to come out Friday. Never heard anything. I'd like you to look at your schedule this week. I really would like you to tour phase three. 
You know, everybody says they care about the unhoused. They want to know what's going on. Well, here's your chance. It's very important. And I really hope that you can take a half an hour or maybe a few minutes longer to come out. And I'd be happy to tour you um, that area. And you can see how people are living. This is an environmental disaster. This is a health emergency. People shouldn't be treated this way, and nobody is stepping up, and it's very discouraging. Please, let's get porta potties. There's no, I can, I'll, I'll get them. You know, I can do it in, in two minutes. Thank you. John Falkenberg, followed by Tessa Woodmancy. My name is John Falkenberg, and I'm a senior at Prospect High School. I'm a first time voter in the recent recall election for the governor of California. I'm interested in encouraging more widespread voter participation in future mayoral elections. Since the mayor is such an important position to our city, I believe we should align the city of San Jose mayoral election with the presidential election. Many people in our city vote for the presidential election, but in the past years they is not there has not been a very high voter turnout in mayoral elections. According to Commissioner Garrett Percival, a political science professor at San Jose State University, this proposal is designed to make San Jose mayoral elections more representative of the community and to give a greater voice to people who have often been left out of our political process. In 2018, according to Ballotpedia, only 159,346 people voted in the mayoral election. According to the Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters in 2018, the city of San Jose's turnout was just below 40%. Our mayor has to represent all of us since we are such a diverse community. We need more voters to be involved in choosing the mayor. In April 2019, the city council narrowly defeated aligning the mayoral and presidential elections. Recently, the San Jose Charter Review Commission over overwhelmingly voted in favor of this idea. I would like to add my voice to support this important change. Thank you for hearing my comments. I have eight hands up. Tessa Woodmancy followed by Paul Soto. Yes, it's very disturbing to hear this unhoused person having to ask for porta potties and that she called her representative and nobody responded. This, <coughs> this is very much the common, the common uh, state of affairs you know, the city of San Jose, I tell everybody that I talk to on the phone, all the businesses that have voice over IP to go to their home and are so happy to work in their home. I say our city did not do that, would not allow us to, you know, would not allow the connection to their homes, didn't figure out, here we are, the head of Silicon Valley, how to, you know, voice over IP to forward the phones to the homes. And so we had about a year and a half of no contact with our, 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 our citizens. And you like that. You like that. That's what you like. So, you know, the thing is, you don't do that. And then what I'm saying is like, hey, we need public comment in the beginning of the meeting. Here's another reason. The fact that that woman, luckily, because we were on Zoom, thank goodness, you know, she was able to catch you and, and talk to you about her needs. But that's why we need a set time when the, you know you can come at 1.30 or or 2 o'clock. By 2 o'clock, it will be open forum and you can talk about things. This is critical to the survival of, of the people you know, the needs of the people, because they're not getting met. They're not getting met. And on top of that, when, you know, right now, the climate, our, our, climate, our CO2 emissions are going up 5%. They went up 5% this year. That if we're supposed to go to zero by 2030, is what the science says, to stay at 1.5, which actually it's 1.5 degrees C above, above pre-industrial levels. We're already at 1.5. We're already, it's in the rear view mirror. So we're going towards two or three. OK, or five. And the thing is, we're not making the change. We have to have seven percent reduction every year to get to 2030 to reduce it by 50 percent. But things have gotten so much worse with, you know, nature kicking in with the fires, adding more CO2, the permafrost melting the you know, there's so many problems. And the, the Amazon is now a, a now a source of carbon. Paul Soto, followed by Colin User One. Uh, yes. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, when I'm going through the, the allocation of funding and the uh, logic and reasoning behind all the different policies, what I noticed is the order, word order. If you look at the if you look at the document, you'll look at 
uh, child need for support, and then you'll go down and say public spaces, you know, public safety, and then it the the associations and the word associations and work proximities of poverty, low income uh, people, uh, uh, pe persons of color. Um, let me see, uh, people in need, limited means, and the word association between those and words like danger, uh, need for safety, public safety, uh, police officers, SJPD, you you know what's, what's being done to you. This is a propaganda technique that is actually has an algorithm to it to create those words associations. So in the mind, when they're reading it and they're, the, the mind is processing it, it's making those connections on a, on a very, like, like, a, like a sub level to where it's there and it can be accessed. And it creates a system where a person can practice cognitive dissonance and remove the dissonance from being challenged morally because they're not supporting a particular issue. They're able to overcome the cognitive dissonance because they're pointing at the fact that these issues are like, they're diametrically opposed, but they make sense of them in their mind because it's been done for them within these documents by making those word associations. So for example, the person just says, oh, oh low income, low income people, persons of color, SAPD. And the mind records that. And this is being done strategically. I don't like it. I'm calling you out on it. Please stop it because people's lives are being literally desecrated and decimated as a result of that language. Please stop it. Call on user one, followed by Roland. Yeah, this is uh, picking up the phone. This is a San Jose phenomenon. You know, this, you, you cannot call the police department for anything that's like non-emergency related. Even if you call 911, they put you on hold. But, this, you know, the city council people, you guys don't pick up your phone. Uh, sometimes like, people get back to me from Pam Foley's office. Uh, good on Scott. Scott Hughes down there. He at least has the stones to talk to me. Most but uh, other city council people forget it. San Jose PD, the worst. You cannot go down and call every single number. I did it the other day. Nobody picks up the phone on their on their phone uh, directory. There, they're too good. They're too snooty, too smug. What do you expect for people going to become millionaires for their retirement? But I really urge you people to pick up the phone and call people back. And that's what gets people frustrated. Is that you don't respond you don't and you're too afraid to because of your vanity you don't want to pick up the phone because you don't want to hear the complaints because you're too good to hear the complaints because you're you're in the power structure and you don't like the criticism you think you're above it you're not so i really recommend uh not only the San Jose pd pick up the phone but they need to learn how to turn their lights on when they're driving their car when it's dark out can you imagine this these people drive around without their lights on. I, I must have seen it 10 times in the last year. And I don't get out much. But when I do, there's San Jose PD, no lights on. Are they too good to turn their lights on because they're too good to answer the telephone down there? I really find it revolting. And the Chief Mata, he, he promised good customer service from the city of San Jose, San Jose Police Department. And he's not providing. Neither are you. Roland, followed by Sheena. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to address you on the current status of the um, uh, the BAP uh, project, specifically car tunnel tunnel and station design. And I'd like to close off with a potential BAP, uh, path forward. Um, as you may have read in the press, the the BAP project costs um, are now at uh, 9.1 uh, billion dollars. And the good news is we're getting $2.3 billion from the Fed, but the bad news is where are we going to find a $6.8 billion match when we couldn't possibly uh, afford $4 billion last time. Um, on the tunnel design, we all agree that downtown requested a, a single ball uh, strategy to eliminate impact, but we can cut, can cut down, can cut, can cut costs down uh, with single ball tunneling down to one and a half miles between Jerry and Pleasant Street. Um, and if 
At that time, we increased the tunnel diameter back to 56 feet. We can now um, have station entrances on both sides of the street. Which brings uh, me to the next question is why is the Mercury News reporting the VT is proposing to eminent domain developers instead of collaborating with them on multiple entrances on each side of Santa Clara, including North First and South Second. So in closing, I strongly encourage you to work with Google and others to engage the community on station design, just like they engage the community on downtown West visual guidelines. Thank you very much. Sheena, followed by Aurelia Sanchez. I'm here to talk about the 71 Vista Montaña site again. Um, I wanted to, I know that you've heard from us a lot and I've noticed this trend that you're thinking of us as whining about it because just a small site, it's just a few RVs. And I wanna remind you that this is not the case. Every time I brought up the location, you've said, oh, there's a, a, another site that's opening four or five blocks from my house. And we're talking about a site that is two feet from our houses and two feet from our toddler park. Um, and it is still open and it is still causing problems. I'm glad to hear that you're talking about setbacks from residences and parks for future sites, but this is still open. It is still causing problems. Uh, City Manager McGuire said that she visited the site and found it pretty clean compared to an unsanctioned encampment that is completely out of control and had, has had multiple fires. Whereas this is a fully funded program that is spending up to $45,000 per person for just nine months, but is being turned into a parking lot for unoperational vehicles and a junkyard, providing only porta potties, none of the services that these people need to get back on their feet, nowhere to go indoors as it gets cold, no showers to make people feel human, no laundry, no caseworkers, no education classes, no wellness opportunities, nothing, none of the type of support that they need to get back on their feet. Meanwhile, we are seeing lots of problems. We are seeing threatening behavior in our own playgrounds. One of my female neighbors got charged at the children's park by somebody who was yelling. She scooped up her dog and ran away terrified. The people arriving and sitting on our children's play structures, smoking up or doing drugs, they're not of sound mind and they are threatening us. And we did not have these problems before the site was brought into our neighborhood. You need to close the site down. This is really important. Security is non-existent. An abandoned car sitting at the driveway does not constitute security. It's a sign, not a cop. Our neighbors have seen that there's nobody on duty several times, even though there's supposed to be 24 hour security. Plus security has been harassing our neighborhoods and is not prepared to deal with this population. We need to shut this program down soon. We haven't heard a timeline yet, even though the plan is to move them to a better site. Please take care of this and do this promptly. Thank you. Aurelia Sanchez followed by Shri. Hello, my name's Aurelia Sanchez. And uh, the reason why I'm, I'm here is because I would love for the city of San Jose to fund more money for our San Jose Police Department, parking control, and in general, probably more staffing in all departments, especially the police department. Um, you know, I live in a high crime rate area that's densely populated. And, um, you know, there's lots of times when we need them and they just can't come. Um, it's a safety issue. It's a quality of life issue. And uh, I don't know if I missed the opportunity to speak or be spoken on this, but, um, you know, I get pretty busy as a resident of the city and it's really hard for me to get involved with all the council meetings and everything that's important. But the pandemic showed a lot of cracks in our city and especially the police department. So please, if you can, give me more, more money to the police department and especially the mental health mobile unit. Um, thank you for your time and um, hopefully you take into consideration what I just said. Thank you. Shri followed by Ophelia Hernandez. Shri. Okay, I'm going to move on to Ophelia Hernandez. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is pertaining to 71 Vista, Montana. Uh, Coleman site, which is very similar to what the Apple site was. Have you taken a drive over there? Would you actually get down and walk through there by yourself? And I'm not talking about with your coworkers and police while working, doing outreach, but by yourself. I doubt it. I double thought even driving my car through there. This place looks like a war zone, something that shouldn't even exist here in San Jose, in Silicon Valley. It looks like a third world country. Broke down cars, piles of trash, burnt down buildings. But if you look close enough, you'll see people in there living in these conditions. No one has come to the rescue for years. No one has cared for years, but speak dollars and cents to you guys and taking away your funding. And all of a sudden, they are your number one priority and nail the problems that are put into our local neighborhoods. We often think and question, why are they there? What got them there? And why when help is rendered, do some of them deny it? Like the people that are living at 71 Vista, Montana. Residents around 71 Vista, Montana had no choice and no say. Residents just had to accept the fact that you want to put them right over our backyard wall or, under, uh, or on the other side of our children's park. They're literally separated by a fence. I'm very concerned when I hear advocates and council members and others trying to compare a city ran site to an unsanctioned site like Coleman or Apple. Are you kidding me? There's no comparison. They are obviously very different for a reason. But do your job. Go drive through there and then come back and tell me, would you be comfortable with the Coleman site or even the Apple site relocated to your neighborhood with limited or no resources? You guys should take the rest of this funding and use it properly and stop wasting it. Get them into real housing and shut this site down immediately. I have four hands up, Jiang Yoon, followed by Hoda. Uh, hello, hi. Um, my name is Jiang Yoon, a resident nearby 71 Vista Montana safe RB parking site. I would like to address to Ms. Jennifer McGuire, our, our new city manager, for hosting a community meeting with Mr. Cohen and talking to us District 4 residents of your vision and providing a very good informational session on San Jose City in general. Thank you for speaking to us, even though you had such a difficult speaking that day, uh, rather than postponing the meeting. Uh, we appreciate it. I also appreciate the memo that was submitted last week during City Hall on the suggested setbacks that the unhoused encampment should not be established near a city-owned park or a city-owned property sharing the fence with a residential area. That really makes a good sense and appreciate making such reasonable recommendation. So my next point is that we believe that current 71 Vista Montana site is in disagreement with two of the recommendations that city is making. And we would like to, and one that being the site is near a, um, uh, city park and another one is uh, sharing the fences with residential neighborhood. So I would like to have that site shut down and uh, m move these people to better, better, much nicer place. I think city of San Jose can do it. Thank you very much. Hoda followed by Scott Largent. Hi, this is Hoda, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm also speaking regarding uh, 71 Vista Montana site. Again, thank you uh, for the audience for listening and for the memorandum from last week. We definitely agree that such sites should not be within um, 500 feet, if not more, of city parks. Uh, currently, this location is in fact wall to wall, in, and it's actually a fence, not even a full wall with a park where children are playing all the time or should be playing, they stop. So we ask and we urge you to please relocate the site as soon as possible. Um, we're, we're still not getting any re other responses. We've raised many concerns about the site in the past few weeks. We're getting very generic responses. We need to understand when this site is to be shut down 
and how this site was picked in the first place, in, even if it was an emergency situation, because this should not be happening. We were also told that there was a $500,000 dollar uh, fund for this location to cover 20 RVs. If you do the math, 500,000 over 20 RVs for nine months, that's a total of 25,000 per RV. That's actually the rent of a one bedroom apartment in Palo Alto, which is one of the ex most expensive places in the Bay Area. Take the money and give them decent housing. It's doable. It's not impossible. They will get a parking spot. They will get running water and electricity instead of a place where they have no access to any facility and barely one security card that is always empty. We've passed by the location many times and we've not seen physical security. Thank you. Scott Largent followed by Thomas Doherty. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Largent. You know, I've been hearing a lot of uh, public comment, both on a county level and a city level in regards to the site at 71 Vista, Montana. I have said this over and over again, that if the um, city and county, or pretty much the city for that site, had taken the time to figure out who would be going there, um, I'm not necessarily saying shake down these people, but you really could have made that site work. And you could have put people there that um, would not have been a problem. They were basically just all lumped. Um, their stuff was towed over there, and no one really took the time to figure it out. So, and you guys all know I'm, I'm homeless. I'm a homeless advocate. I, I care about the people on the streets. Um, I, I, this might sound weird. I actually am kind of enjoying the feedback right now from the residents near that site because they are kind of putting the pieces together. They're realizing the failures of our city. They're starting to realize that these people really do need adequate care. Some of them need to be taken care of, and they're starting to realize what happened there. It, it could have been a success. Um, this is the same situation that has happened now out of the crash zone. You guys have created a humanitarian disaster by shoving everybody into basically one zone and pretty much into the creek with no real services. You have to stop telling law enforcement out there that everybody got offered shelter and housing because that's not what happened. And some of these other people that are getting on the calls, I would really love for them to start paying attention also to what's going on out there. Um, at the crash zone, because this is citywide, and each one of these new endeavors you guys kind of dive into is a failure, and it does crash and burn, and I, I'm just surprised you guys haven't taken the time to figure out who's out there, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and kind of make it easier for the, uh, the other residents in our city. I, I, I don't blame them getting on here and being extremely frustrated, so thank you. Thomas Doherty. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting me talk. Uh, I will agree with some things Mr. Uh, Largent just said and, and some things I won't. I disagree. I don't think it could ever work. And for the reasons that the uh, city of San Jose put forth in their recent memo, which you should never put a homeless encampment next to a city park where children are playing. Not only did the city of San Jose do this once, they did it twice. There's two parks. If you could have chose a worse spot you wouldn't be able to because it just doesn't exist. And that, and I know Mr. Cohen must have got a ton of money from Apple for his next campaign. And dude, good luck to that because we're going to fight you at every step of the way. This is the one of the worst decisions in the history of mankind and this, the history of city planning. Think about it. You put RVs with generators that pollute the environment, people smoking, people doing drugs, bound needles, there's, there's dumping oil and other toxic uh, wastes, and, and it's right next to a children's park, and like, wake the F up, everybody. What's going on here? We are not going away. We're redoubling our efforts. We're, we're getting legal involved. We get the media involved. We're doing everything we can to stop this insanity. This is the stupidest thing. Don't you guys have any pride in what you do like oh my god well we screwed up okay let's just let's just move these people out of here and and pretend it didn't happen because it's an embarrassment folks i have published a, a this is the, a, an article that this is silicon valley's guantanamo bay it's all over social media the, the city of san jose being the quote-unquote capital of silicon valley should know better than to put this monstrosity next to children's parks and, and all of the things that go along with that. And it's worse, worse than that, it's a disservice to the people who are there who are trapped in this razor wire enclosure 
Uh, thank you, City of San Jose. Fix it. Michelle Kalish. Hi, my name is Michelle Kalish. I'm a uh, resident of District 3. On the subject of parks and, and homeless encampments, um, it's been very frustrating. I'm in District 3. I live between two major parks, Roosevelt and Olander. Olander is near a school. Roosevelt is a park and a community center. Both of them are, are homeless camps, and they've been that way for years. Um, the, the area around that seems to just be a, a freeway between the two parks. I get very frustrated on the subject of parks when the city comes to me and wants my input on a new park. Yeah, it seems like every new park just becomes a homeless encampment. I don't understand why we're sending money, money on new parks when we can't maintain the parks that we already have. And I understand we're trying to build new neighborhoods and all that. Second thing is um, the issue of the, the the Google new village that's coming through. Have we decided as a city that we're just going to abandon the current downtown area along Santa Clara Street where the current city hall is? The building seems to be empty. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that are failing. City hall could be supporting a lot of those small businesses if they bring their people back to work um, in, the, in the facility itself. But the, the, it seems like that whole downtown area is pretty much going downhill. Uh, in terms of just small business, there is no shopping, there is no growth, and it doesn't seem to be from what, what I can see anyway, uh, many plans to see that uh, moving forward. Thank you. Back to the mayor. Thank you, the meeting's adjourned, everybody.